Can you tell me about the whole process? And I mean from day one, from the day that you woke up and you said, I need to make this movie about this person. Um, sure. I started writing this script for Meet Monica Valore um, when I was stuck in traffic coming back from upstate New York. And uh, I'd been thinking about a, you know, movies all start as themes and sort of characters. And I'd been thinking about some different kind of characters. And I was sort of thinking about basic themes of the movie. And I just uh, pulled a, uh, <laughs> a speeding ticket from my, my friend's glove box and I started writing on the back of it. And I kept writing the whole time uh, we were stuck in traffic, which I think was like it was like two or three more hours before we got back, and uh, and that was the seed of it. And you know, the first thing I started doing was I started writing a biography of Monica, and I wrote all the films she made and where she was born, and you know, sort of tr tried to make that character real. And um, then I started writing it. I think it took me about eight months to finish the first draft, and. It was finished in 2005 and or late 2004 and it's 2011 the movie's coming out so uh, and you know honestly I'm lucky to have it come out at all I mean I uh, years ago I visited a guy named Steve DeJarnett who uh, directed a couple movies and he writes a lot for TV and you know he makes a good living in LA and his kitchen is filled with scripts that are from the, the counters all the way up those long you know those big Ikea uh, Cupboards are filled with scripts of movies that will never get made. So, including, like, you know, he was on that uh, that blacklist or whatever that is, that list of the best unproduced scripts in Hollywood. He had a script on that, never got made. So, um, so speaking of all those intimidating factors, you know, what made you want to do this oh then? God, I don't know. Um, well, you know, I wanted to, I, I, movies are my first love. I, the first thing I remember about being alive was seeing a movie. Um, I was in the hospital when I was. Two, I had, had asthma, and uh, they were showing King Kong on TV. Because back before there was like the WB and all the UPN and stuff, they UHF stations showed a lot of movies, and uh, I saw King Kong, and uh, I was into movies ever since. And uh, I don't know, it's just it's like it's like being a drug addict. It's just like you know you can go to rehab, but you probably go back on it. So. You know, I, the, the movie world has tried to kick me in the teeth numerous times, but I still love it. You know, it's an abusive relationship. I get something out of it, though. It's just, you know, it's just, it's it's a very weird time. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people on the internet who are filmmakers or students or wannabe filmmakers or actors or whatever. There are more people in show business now than ever. And I think there are actually less jobs. And, but they, And people all over the world want to be in movies. It's like our... It's like winning the lottery. It's like the dream. It's like being royalty, you know? And um, a lot of people are making films, and a lot of people are making actually pretty interesting films. There's no work, though. It's like less people are buying films and seeing films. And, you know, it's... Uh, in the 30s, they, before television, movies would change every three days, and they would always be a double bill. So movies got made like crazy. Now, you know, there's less films, and... Uh, more free on the internet and it's just becoming a very very different world so how do you feel at this point i mean you know just last year you were still on the festival route and now you're you're getting your big release so i i would imagine it'd be that hint of that feeling of royalty somewhere there uh, no it's it's about work for me i'm look i'm thrilled the movie's getting in theaters i'm absolutely thrilled i'll be more thrilled if people show up and see the movie um no it's just to me it's work it's like you know What's what am I doing next? What's next? It's like, you know, things these things take so long and so much effort. You just always have to be working on something else. And also, you know, you could have three scripts that you really love, and three producers of those three scripts, and maybe one or two will get made. You know, even Steven Spielberg has projects that never get made. Uh, so no, it's it's great, but it's work. You know, press is work, premieres are work. You have to show up on time. You have to say the right things. It's like it's like a job interview all day long. So speaking so. of getting something made, as you approach the script, are there like certain are there certain elements that you thought were necessary to include to make this story appeal to certain? Because everyone's looking at markets too. Sure, and all sure. That. I mean, when I wrote Meet Monica Valore, the thing I thought I'd, I'd made a short film that done very well, and I thought, well, I got to make a feature. How do you get a feature made? Well, you have a commercial idea. And to me, this was a commercial idea, you know, a, a teenage boy, a comedy about a teenage boy who is in love with an old forgotten porn star. 
It's like, well, it's got sex, it's got teenagers, it's like commercial. You know, my approach to it, I think, was a little bit non-commercial, but, um, you know, it was high concept. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, if I have other scripts that are not so high concept and don't have a big part for a over 40 actor or actress, and uh, those didn't get made, you know, it's or not yet. So, yeah, you, I mean, you have to sort of think about that a little bit, or I did, and it worked. And how does that come into play with casting, too? Because, like, you did get Kim, and yep. then you got Dustin, who's very good, but you even mentioned in the roundtable today you had someone like Clark Duke mm-hmm. come in, and, you know, I, I know him from some of his bigger films more so than I had Dustin before seeing this. Yep. So what made you go that route? Well, it was a, you know, outside of someone like Michael Sarah, uh, or maybe just an, Jesse Eisenberg, who's, who's obviously too old to play Toby, um, teenagers don't really make Nobody will give you a million dollars because you have a teenager who's well known. I mean, Clark Duke, no one's going to give him three million dollars to make a movie. He, he's very funny, um, but also it's about you know it was something and you know God bless my producers who saw that this was the case. You really need someone to carry the movie. He's in every scene, and if he's funny, that's not going to carry a movie like this. I mean, it's going to be funny, but it's going to be like sketch comedy. Um, and Dustin was funny, and Dustin was a good enough actor where he could give the part depth and range, and they were very, they realized that's what needed to happen, and I did too, so. Going back to the fact that you had Clark come in and audition, as well as someone like Dustin, it that makes it feel like maybe you had a very broad idea of who Toby was at the time. Yeah, I mean, originally he was a fat kid in the script, and but, you know, when you talk to casting people, it's like, there's actually not very many fat people in acting. If you're fat, I totally recommend getting into acting because that's the last people that get into acting and there's no fat. I mean, it's, you know, it's a niche market. Um, so, yeah, there was no fat kids, so the casting people were like, well, what what other kind of nerds can you see? I was like, well, tall and skinny is always good. Um, short and odd looking. You know, whatever you got, bring the nerds on. And uh, they did, and, and uh, you know, some of them were really bizarre looking. To, like, too bizarre looking to watch for 90 minutes. You'd just be like, go away. You know, it's like maybe the best friend or maybe the guy in one good scene, but it was like some out people... Of, out of curiosity, what would make someone... What, what was one example oh, yeah. of one person you I should be talking about that. bizarre looking, right? The uh, No, they were just kids who looked like little mutants, like who had who had really big heads and really exaggerated features and really small eyes. They just looked like somebody, like a like Mr. Potato Head got screwed up a little bit. Um, and you know, I see there, I see those kids now and they're in commercials, they're always the pizza delivery guy who gets the door slammed on Don't say something. that because I just saw Dustin play a pizza delivery guy on Glee. On Glee, well, Dust, that's, what, that's what those kids get, get cast for. <laughs> um, but Dustin was actually semi-handsome too, so like that, uh, we needed that too because you know, if he's this sort of gene-splicing experiment, mutant-looking kid, you're, you're, it's going to just put a whole other dimension when he's making out with Kim Cattrall. You know, it's going to be a little bit blah. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, and with the, the, the nerdy girl, Amanda, basically what happened was instead of getting all these sort of mutant-looking kids, there are no weird-looking girls in Hollywood movies. So we got really pretty girls who put glasses on and screwed their hair up, and it was like, no, no, no. And Ji Young Han was one of the few um, actors who seemed at all genuine to be a little bit of a misfit. And uh, she's working a lot. She's in the new um, Jason Reitman movie. Uh, so she's, she's, she's had a very good career for herself. But uh, once again, Niche, she's a heavy, funny Asian girl, and there are not many of those in the movie business it's, it seems like only pretty people want to be in movies well it's like guess what there's five thousand five million pretty actresses or want to be actresses you're no one's going to care there's someone prettier than you there's someone more famous than you if you're a little odd looking maybe you'll get work speaking of the looks of your characters you take someone a fashion icon a beautiful fashion icon like kim cattrall and you basically put her on a fast food diet and tell her not to go to the gym so in turn you're kind of doing the same thing with her as well sure it's just my aesthetic you know i mean i think that movies should be like stylized representations of reality but it has to have roots in reality you know kim cattrall playing this part 
looking. I mean, she's un, unearthly good looking. I mean, she's 50 something years old. She's beautiful. She's got a great body. And uh, that's just not the character that I'm portraying. It's not reality in America. I mean, people look like your mom when they're 50 years old. They look middle aged and they're heavy or, you know, they've got gray hair or any of those things. So you want to sort of skew things to being a little more realistic for me. And it's interesting. I, I uh, had a friend of mine who um, I work in Paris and she came up to me and she said, oh, I have a friend who's an actress. You got to meet her. She's the most beautiful actress in the world. And I was like, have you watched any of my films? I have no interest in the most beautiful actress in the world. If you said I have the most ugly actress in the world, I'd be like, sure, I'll, I'll see the most ugly actress in the world. No, but I mean, it's like, I feel like you're, you're, if, if you don't have some reality in your movie, if there's not a connection to the way we all live and we all look, um, you're basically saying, fuck you to your audience. Or you're lying to them. And uh, that's not why I'm doing this. I want to at least tell a partial truth. And I also want people to realize that how you are, you and the audience, how you are, how you live your life, the way you look, is fine. It's great. You are attractive. You are worthy of love. You have dignity. You know, it's like I think a lot of this sort of Superman and Superwoman cinema of America, where everything's fashionable, and beautiful, and all the breasts are perfect, and all the lips are perfect, and all the men are ripped and have washed per dabs, is kind of. Um, it's, it's a way to make everyone feel crappy about their lives, deep down. And you know what? There's nothing wrong with our lives. And having washboard abs is not going to make your life perfect. <laughs> and, and having big fake tits is not going to make your life perfect either. So and After this interview, you're going to have every less than perfect actor and actress knocking on your door. Great, great. I'd like to see more of them. <laughs> so going back to uh, casting Kim... How did you go about reeling her in? Did you send her the script and she just fell for it? No, her, Kim's uh, agent, um, the script is going around the agencies and people seem to like it and, and uh, my producer sent it to her. And, you know, we had a huge list of actors that were in consideration. I mean, Madonna, <laughs> Julianne Moore, uh, Fran Drescher, Kathleen Turner, um, uh, Jennifer Tilly, a bunch of actors who were in the in the mix and Kim's a New Yorker and I, I'm a New Yorker so I met her and um, you know I didn't really know anything about her I mean I knew she had a really good reputation as a stage actress and I knew of Sex in the City never seen it um, still to this day? no I saw the movie I saw number one I didn't see number two um, the um, and I knew her 80s movies. You know, I knew she was fun on screen and, and she had a good energy and she had good star power. I didn't know her. She was a real actor, though. And, um, but I knew she had a great reputation on stage. So I met with her over lunch and she was funny and she was smart and she was very not like a star at all, really easygoing. And uh, she really loved the script. And we talked a lot about the character and she said a lot of right things. And she was like, this character should smoke. And this character should this and this that really perceptive stuff and really surprising because she's a glamour puss you know she's always looking great and uh, you know at the end of the interview or the meeting I said you know this is all super but you're the best looking 51 year old woman in America and you're way too pretty for this part and if you're going to even think about doing it you're going to have to realize you're going to have to gain weight and we're going to make you look bad and uh, otherwise it's just going to be fake it's going to be Hollywood so um, she said sure you know, originally I think I told her like 50 pounds. <laughs> and she said, I can't do that without a doctor. Yeah, and, I think that might be push, pushing and, it health-wise. Yeah, push, and, and so, so she said, you know, it's like we we're basically haggling at that point. She was like, I was like 30. She was like 25. And I was like, okay, 25. Um, and then, you know, her manager called my producer and said, my producer called me and my producer said, what did you say to her? I was like, oh, God, she hates me. And she's like, no. She says she wants to do the movie and she loves you. How'd that feel for you at that point? Did, I mean, did it feel like more real than ever then? Yeah, it felt like, okay. It felt both ways. It felt like, okay, like, this is really, like, someone is really responding to what I have to say and my work is great. And maybe the movie will get made now. Um, but also it was like, oh, God, I've, I've made the decision now. I Kim Cattrall is going to be Monica Valor. Um because, you know, the, the thing I always knew about this movie, it's like every movie has meat and potatoes. And the meat and potatoes is this movie is the woman who plays Monica Valor has to be great. And the kid who plays Toby has to be real. It doesn't have to be great. It just has to be real. 
and everything else is parsley and, and onions and, and you know dessert but that's the meat and potatoes and if you don't get your meat and potatoes you're screwed so I worked really hard to make sure that Kim had what she needed to be great you know we took a lot of time rehearsing and talking about the script and she really felt involved in the creative process which is not what act, act, usually actors get and for the for the kid you know I really talked about how he was feeling for Dustin you know what was real and made sure he wasn't too Hollywood and or too corny and so uh, yeah so you know you can only get you can't get everything with a movie you know unless you're Stanley Kubrick and you take two years to make it and you control every single element especially in a low budget movie like you're getting like 60% of what you want and uh, you're doing good because I think a lot of movies you watch them and you're like what was happening here like why is this coming together it's because it's uh, things can just get away from you you know so once you did step foot on set, I mean, you're on the set of your very first feature film. How did it feel to you, day oh, one? I was, I was born to be on the set of a feature film. Uh, you know, it was, the, it was very nerve-wracking being on set the first few days. And the scenes we shot the first few days, I'm, don't, I'm not fans of. Um, as time went by, you know, it's like you've got this incredible machine you're a part of. It's like 50 people who are all working with you or against you actors and lighting and camera and sound and costume and props it just goes on and on and on and they might get what you're trying to do they might be adding to what you do or they might not get what you do so uh no it was, but it was very nerve-wracking and also we had like we would shoot scenes and it have to be done in three hours it's really really fast like the thing is about low budget movies like the scene where toby and monica break up we shot that in a half a day like on a normal movie, that would take three days. How many pages was that? Like three and a half, four pages of script. Uh, so, yeah. So, you know, real movies take like 60 days to shoot. We shot in 26. So how did you approach it in terms of, you know, particular shots you wanted to get versus the amount of takes you might have wanted to have? Um, was it more important to, to capture, like, the exact positions you wanted of the action or was it more important to nail the performances it was more important to nail the performances for sure I mean there was certain shots I I really wanted but you know the, the important thing is just to make sure that everything stays real within the world and all the actors and everyone knows what's going on and the big thing with, a sh with the movie on a short schedule is just to prepare everything really prepared we talked to the actors me and my director of photography we went through every location to describe beforehand exactly what we're going to do because you just don't have time. Like the scene where uh, Toby goes back to see Claude and they're making a sign and they hug and then he's, he's hitchhiking. Uh, we filmed that all in 15 minutes. And my, literally, my line producer said, looked at his watch and said, sun's going down in 15 minutes. And I said, put the camera on the ground, please clear the flame. And you know you have you have a hundred people around you, so I'm literally as they're starting the scene, seconds like a second before the scene you see in the movie, there's crew people walking through the scene with sandwiches because I'm like clear the flame. I can't even say clear the frame. I was like get away, go 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 go, because you know when the sun goes down you're screwed because you can't do it the next day because that's your schedule for the day. We don't to have another day of shooting is probably like another fifty thousand dollars. As tight as you were though at the round tables, Kim said that you had also shot a lot of things that you didn't even get to use. Yeah, because the original cut of the movie is like two hours long. Um, but it's just, uh, for writers out there, like when you write a script, a lot of the scenes were like six pages of dialogue. And I was like, I want to make sure everyone understands what's going on and who these people are. Well, if you have good actors and you cast right, people will know what these people are. So like we cut out a lot of stuff that was just extraneous because we felt like we needed them to say it. But you feel it in the performances, and you know there's a lot of stuff visually that's happening that in between the lines that says all the stuff we needed to say. So um, it's a lesson learned. Economy. You know. So last year when we spoke, you told me about God Hates Kansas. Compared to then, where has this piece moved now? God Hates I'm, Kansas. I'm has, very curious. God Hates Kansas has a producer, uh, so I have a producer, and the contract is signed. Uh, we're talking to casting right now. We're this next week, um, I was meeting with casting people in LA, and you know, um, we've made a couple offers to people. Um, 
Uh, Melissa, McCar Melissa McCarthy from from Mike and Molly turned it down because <laughs> I want a fat I want a fat woman and there's not a lot of fat people in, in movies so she turned it down. Um, I'm not sure whether she thought it was too weird or she was just tired of you know she's a TV actress so she works a lot. Uh, but we're gonna go out to more actors and you know hopefully it'll get made. Is know? that the central character of the piece? It's an ensemble piece, but she's one of the central characters. So. Um, but uh, it's very hard to find a heavy actress. And where would you want to shoot that one? In Kansas? I think if we shot in Kansas, someone would shoot us. <laughs> so even though it's not anti-Kansas or anti-God, um, but the name God Hates Kansas would scare people. Uh, I don't know, um, maybe Michigan or Missouri, just because they have very good tax rebates. That's why everyone's shooting in Michigan, because they have really good tax rebates. So. And I'm assuming very real, just like all the, all the things that you hope to do. Yes. So, you know, an, an end of the world kind of thing, a disaster piece? Yeah, it's just like, it's a disaster where nobody knows the world's ending. It's like, it's like a lot of things. It's, things come and you don't, it's by the time you know, it's kind of already done. So we're not talking crazy CGI or any effects oh, no, or anything? Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no, it's like a $3 feeling. million dollar movie. There's no, there's no crazy CGI. But it's like, you know, as a New Yorker, I lived through 9-11. And 9-11 was a horrible tragedy that, like, changed this country and changed the world but for everyone who's a New Yorker it was the most weird benign disaster it's like I was walking out of my apartment and my neighbor who's always sitting on the stoop of the apartment all day long says yo man you, you can't go to subway there's an attack in the World Trade Center and I was like what? it's like yeah the subways are closed because they threw a plan at the World Trade Center man you, it's like you can go up in the hill and look at it and I was like just out of nowhere there's no warning you know like that's the thing. It's like we have to really embrace life because horrible things. It's not like a movie where there's music swelling and characters yelling and you have to just build up. It just happens. And uh, if the end of the world's going to happen, it's probably going to happen pretty quick. So that's what God Aids Kansas is partially about.